who have we got next? Can we skip the next? Can we skip the next one? You can skip it. That's fine with me. <laughs> Our next speaker is Charlotte Gelfand. Um, Charlotte's a freelance R developer right here in Toronto. Made the Open Data Toronto um, package. How popular is that one now, Charlotte? I think 13,000 downloads, all from U of T students, thanks to you. <laughs> 13,000 downloads, which is pretty, pretty remarkable, um, has interests in a wide variety of areas, um, builds out fantastic shiny apps, um, does cool quantitative statistical modeling, I don't know, does all sorts of awesome things. Uh, so thanks very much for agreeing to talk, Charlotte. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let me share my screen here. Can you see that? Yeah, it looks great. Good. Okay, cool. So uh, I am not an academic or a researcher, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, reproducibility in the context of what happens when you have issues with your code. So uh, Rohan is already laughing, which is great to see. Um, the title of this talk is Make a Reprex, Please. If you don't know what that means, you will soon, um, and you can find it at a very similar URL. Uh, so when you're programming, eventually your code will break. When I say eventually, I mean like probably 10 or 20 times a day, but you're gonna look for help. So you might look for help on Google, you might Google your errors, you might look on Stack Overflow, but inevitably you might come to a situation where like someone has not asked the problem that you have or they can't find someone who has asked it. Or if you have, there's no solution. So I really like this comic from XKCD. I think a lot of us can relate to this. Never have I felt so close to another soul and yet so helplessly alone. Because when I Google an error, there's one result, a thread by someone with the same problem and no answer last posted to in 2003. So who were you, Denver Coder 9? What did you see? And how can I get a solution to my problem? So when this happens, eventually you will have to ask for help. And how do you ask for help? You have to send someone your code. There's a number of different ways that you can do this. So. Uh, this is an example of an error that can pop up uh, when you're using dplyr. So I load dplyr, I take empty cars, and I filter for cylinders equals six, and I get an error here. So if I share so this with someone, they probably have a pretty good idea of what I'm asking. This is a decent example. Or you might have something like this, where you load dplyr, you take your dog's data set, filter for is cute, and it returns nothing, which obviously cannot be correct since all dogs are cute, but there's an issue here, right? You haven't shown me what this dog's data set is, so I can't help you with this problem. Or you might have something like this where you load dplyr, you load ggplot, you load read Excel, you load tidy text, janitor and lubricate. You set your working directory, you read in your data, you do some data cleaning, and then you try to do this mutation down here and you get an error that says, problem with mutate input year. X must be a double vector, not a logical vector. And if you send me this, well, first of all, I don't have access to this working directory. And there's a whole bunch of extra stuff here. Or there may be something like this, which I see a lot uh, on various sites on Twitter or in Slacks and stuff where you just send someone a screenshot of your console and a little bit of your code, and you ask them to help you uh, with your error. So there's a few errors here. There's an error about uh, not being able to find string remove all. So you load stringer and then there's some other errors. But if you send this to me, I don't really know which other error you're asking about. And I don't know what any of this code up here does or anything that's happened in the console before this. Or the more extreme example where you send someone a photo of your computer. So I see this a lot. <laughs> it's the same kind of code, but instead of looking at the code, you're like looking at my kitchen. In. Now you're more focused on my coffee setup. You're wondering like, how often does this, this person clean their monitor? You're really not focused on the problems that are going on here. Or you might do something like reach out to someone on Twitter. So this is something that I did uh, back in 2017. I tweeted to Yue, who's the creator of our Markdown. I said, I'm having some issues with Blogdown, which he also created. Every theme I try to install ends up looking like this messed up plain text like this. Any ideas? And I do this, I'm like, I am being super clear. Like, there's no ambiguity about what I'm asking, right? This looks horrible. And UA says, is that screenshot from the RStudio viewer or did you open public index.html in your web browser? And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. He didn't have that information. 
So I say, oh, sorry, that's from our studio, but it looks the same, you know, just debug this for me. And eventually UA goes, it's hard to debug an issue via Twitter. Could you file an issue on the R studio or on the uh, blog down GitHub and show a reproducible example? And UA has probably asked it, or asked people to create a reproducible example 500 times this week. But if you go to Stack Overflow or if you go to the R Studio community, this is everywhere. Every time someone asks a question without giving enough information, they ask for a reproducible example. So we say, I strongly recommend giving enough data and code to create to create a reproducible example. I assume you want something like this. Please make a reproducible example next time. And all of these is super common, people asking for a reproducible example. So what is a reproducible example? I really like this definition um, from the Tidyverse help page. It says, if you need help getting unstuck, the first step is to create a reprex or reproducible example. The goal of a reprex is to package your problematic code in such a way that other people can run it and feel your pain. Then hopefully they can provide a solution and put you out of your misery. And I think when you're struggling with something, you're really focused on this, they can provide a solution and put you out of your misery, bit of it. But the key thing here is actually other people can run it and feel your pain, which when you're so deep into a problem is not something that you think about a lot. You just want someone to help you out. So the first key part of this is other people can run it. I don't know if, if people here remember this like anti-downloading thing, from maybe the early 2000s, you wouldn't download a car. Similarly, you would not run a screenshot. If you send me your code or anyone your code in a screenshot or in a photo or in a video, God forbid, they are not gonna run it. They're not gonna help you. So please do not do this. Send them code that they can actually run. And what are the key elements of that? First, you need to send your libraries. Second, you need your code. And also for libraries, only the libraries that are necessary and all of the libraries that are necessary. For code, same thing, relevant code and only the relevant code. And then third or maybe zero, depending on how you look at this like, okay emoji is your data, which is really important. So let's take a look at this example that I saw before. So I was bored reading through it. You guys were probably bored hearing it, but you know, we load dfire, we load ggplot, read Excel, tidy text, janitor, lubridate do all this stuff, and then eventually we get an error down here. But if you look, there's really only a few relevant lines of code here. So we need dfire in order to do the mutate in case one down below. We need read Excel to read the data. We need the working directory and the data. And then we need to actually do this computation. So at least if you're asking for help on this, you can reduce it to those lines and things are a lot shorter and easier to handle. And you still get the same error here without all of this like garbage of reading tidy text for no reason. Um, and if you don't know what code to include, if you don't know uh, what's causing your error or what makes it go away, I would suggest the age old method of debugging, which is to add one line of code until it breaks or remove one line until it works and then add back in the broken line. That is, I would say like 99% of debugging is figuring out which line makes it break and just including that. And then there's an issue here, right? So I've uh, reduced things to a pretty manageable amount of code and libraries, but the issue here now is with the set working directory and reading in the data. Chances are, if I'm sending you my code, you definitely do not have access to users, Charla, documents, my work folder, project one data. And you probably don't have export 2021-01 version five, and you probably don't care what it is either. I know that when we're working on our own problems, we we like are very interested and very like absorbed by the problems that we're working on. But the reality is, is that like people, they want to help you, but they don't really care about what your data actually is. Um, so to quote TLC, I don't want a CSV, a CSV in your working directory cannot get any love from me. I don't want to be like a, a white rapper doing this, but <laughs> no one cares about your working directory. Nobody cares about your actual specific data. What you want to do is give them a really manageable data set that they can actually see your problem with. And so the way to do this is to create fake data inline. So a really great way to do this is by creating a tibble where you actually just emulate a specific or like a small amount of your data. So you're saying what the X column is and what the Y column is, and you want to make this tiny piece of data that will still reproduce your problem. 
or you can make a triple, which lays out a tipple row wise. So you specify each row separately. And when people read this, they instantly have an idea of what your data looks like and what the problem might be without having to worry about all of your uh, working directory and all of that business. And so now, instead of having loading in my working directory and reading in the data and getting this error, we can reduce it to a pretty simple, really tiny reproducible example where I make a table with the date is 2020-0101. And then I do this mutation and I still get the same error. So we've reduced it all the way from code that takes up the whole screen um, to code that, that looks like this. And the second part is <laughs> feel your pain. So I mean, we're kind of I'm kind of cheating here because I'm running this uh, all in, in Markdown, but the key here is to include your output uh, with, your, with your code. So if you just supplied this code here, nobody has any idea of what's going on with it. But if you include the output as well, then people have a better idea of, of what has gone wrong. And people are pretty good at understanding output. Um, so this is a common problem that just by uh, looking at this, this error, I might be able to, uh, to tell you what went wrong and how to fix it without even having to run, run your code myself. So how do you do this? How do you give someone access to your code and your output and do it in a manageable way? So I'm gonna switch over to some live coding and I hope that nothing goes wrong. <laughs> is that big enough, Rohan? Yeah, it looks perfect. Okay, cool. So this is the problem that we've been uh, looking at so far. So I have um, dplyr, I create my tibble and then I do this mutation. So if I run that, we can see that I get this error. And now if I'm asking someone for help, I need some way to share this with them, right? So let me copy this and say that I'm in a course that's using GitHub where I can ask my prof for help over on GitHub. So let's go and we'll create a new issue. So what's the problem here? Uh, what does this error say? It doesn't matter. I'm going to give this a bad title, which you should not do, but thinking on the fly is hard. So <laughs> if I take this output from our studio, and I paste it into GitHub. Let's see what this looks like. So this is where I'm asking my prof for help or asking someone for help on GitHub. And if I submit a new issue, there's no way that this is like gonna be rendered as code, right? So uh, GitHub uses, um, uses Markdown in order to, to interpret what this is. So this uh, greater than sign is interpreted as, I'll bump this up a little bit, um, is interpreted as a code block these are interpreted as code chunks. And then all of these pluses that were here are interpreted as a list. So if I paste this, like I'm not getting any help from anybody, right? <laughs> Nobody is gonna run this and be like, yeah, perfect. So let's try something else. I'll leave another comment here. And I know that I can do three backticks to create a code chunk, I think at least, you know, I've used our markdown. So if I paste that in and we can use preview this time, we can see that this actually renders pretty well. So let me comment that. And I'm like, okay, I have provided you with this example. This is great. And now I'm your prof, I've changed roles and I come and I wanna help you. So I copy this code and I go to run it in R. Let me clear this. So what happens when I run this code? Let me paste it in. What happens is you cannot run this. So uh, because I copied straight out of the console, what we end up with is the console start things here. Um, there's the text from the output from dplyr. And it's like, this is impossible to run. So maybe I will, down here, maybe I will painstakingly remove the comments and remove the output and stuff and try to run that this time. Let's do that again. And now we have all of these pluses that we have to remove. You know, I'm messing it up. Stressful to do this on the fly, but no one is anyone going to do this for you if you give them your code. So there is a better way to do this rather than just pasting your code in. So the reprex package comes to the rescue for this kind of thing. Um, it does exactly what it says from the name. It helps you to create reproducible examples or reprexes. And there are a few features of this package that are really, really great. The first is that it runs your code in an isolated environment. So it starts a new uh, R environment that doesn't know what packages you already have loaded, where your data is, anything. It just runs exactly what, it tell, what you tell it to. 
Second is that it couples your code and output all in one place so that you can uh, share both together. Um, it helps you share code to different venues. So if you want to share to GitHub or Slack or Stack Overflow, God forbid, um, all of those places have different ways to render code. So it uh, manages all of those. And really helpfully, it can also render images. So um, let's do more live coding. So I'm gonna run through this example that we were just looking at. Let me restart. R. And what I can do is I can go to my add-ins. I'll show a few different ways to do this. Go to add-ins, go all the way down to render reprex and click on that. And a UI will pop up here that gives you, that uh, you can give input to on running your reprex. So you can say, where's the reprex source? In this case, it is the current file. The target venue here is GitHub and I can ask it to render my, my reprex. And while it's working, so it says a message here, rendering reprex and the rendered reprex is on the clipboard. And what it's done is it runs this code in an isolated R session, totally separate from everything else. And it produces the output kind of like how it would look in R markdown. So now we can see here, uh, dplyr is loaded. There's the output, it's all commented out. And then there's my other code. And again, the error, which is also commented out. And now you might think like, what do I do with this? Uh, please do not take a screenshot of this and then post it. I've seen that as well. So it tells you the rendered reprex is on the clipboard. Uh, I'm trying not to like make fun of other people. That's why all of my examples are making fun of myself, but you see a lot of bad code here. Um, so now if I paste this and comment it, we see that dplyr is loaded. All of the output is there, but commented out and the error is reproduced as well. And now if I copy this and I really want to try it out myself, I can kind of go like all the way back around, copy it in. And I see that I get that error as well. So it provides a really good way to do this, um, to do the whole like song and dance of, of getting your code and output all in an isolated um, session. And I'll do one more example here of what happens if you have plots as well. So. Some of you might have seen this problem where you try to create a ggplot where the color of the points or something are blue, but you have specified them in the wrong place. So it says blue over here, but none of your points are blue. Or you do the same thing, you try to make these purple bars and it says purple, but your bars are not purple. And so you might wanna ask someone for help about this. And now we've added like an additional layer layer of complexity where you have to figure out how to get these screenshots over to someone, right? Are you gonna upload them? Are you gonna like drag your screenshots in? You have to figure that out. But luckily, of course, Reprex handles all of that for you. So I'll render this a different way. So I'm gonna copy this code, edit copy, so you know what I did. Load the Reprex package. And if you just type Reprex, it'll automatically take the code that is on your clipboard and render it for GitHub. So it says rendering reprex. The rendered reprex is on the clipboard and this is what it'll look like. So it has, you're loading ggplot. It has this first set of code, the plot that it produces, and then the second set of code and the plot that it produces. And if I go over to my GitHub issues, I'll create a new one with a better title this time. I'll say ggplot two points are not the color that I specify. Oh, preferably you would provide more details there, but you know. So let's take a look at what this looks like. First of all, um, so we have these code chunks starting and stopping around the code. Um, this is something that I missed too before is that you can actually specify that they are R code chunks, just in, like an R markdown and it'll be, it'll do more specific rendering than, than it would do um, just with a general code chunk. And then it actually creates the markdown to include the images. So what Reprex does is it uploads this image onto image imager, sounds like an R package. It uploads that image onto imager and it automatically embeds it into your code. So then when you create this, you have your code chunk, the output and another code chunk. And this illustrates your problem. And it's a much easier way to do it rather than trying to figure out all of that song and dance by yourself. Okay. So if you figure this out, I promise you will feel great. <laughs> this is a tweet from, from Shell. She says, I was today years old when I learned how to create a reprex. 
She always used to send screenshots, which upset many. It would upset me. And then she assisted someone with a piece of code by asking them to post it on a gist, then solve their problem through a reprex and feel superhuman. And also the odds of someone helping you increase by about 1,000%. <laughs> Please do not try to reproduce my findings. Sample size n equals one. I get 1,000 times more help than, than when I just send someone screenshots of my code. And a really good benefit actually is that you might not even need to ask for help. So it's a super common thing that once you've done all of the work of paring down your problem into a reproducible example, getting rid of all of the unnecessary code, unnecessary packages, and simplifying your data, you end up figuring out the problem yourself. And these are two similar tweets. Uh, Steven Turner says, 95% of my problems I solve on my own attempting to create a reproducible example. For the remaining 5%, reprex is a godsend. And Rika Gorn says something that I think we can all relate to is, does anybody else spend like an hour curating the perfect stack overflow question so that you don't get cursed out by a random online bro engineer? And by that, pro by that point, you've already figured out the answer yourself. So this is a really good tool for figuring out what your problem actually is. And if you still need help, people will be way more inclined to help you than if you were setting over a screenshot or something like that. And just as a bonus, um, this is a diagram that talks about uh, where to ask for help online. Um, so we have a few different features over on the columns here. So whether you can provide a reprex, whether uh, it allows for discussion, create searchable solutions. Um, so Stack Overflow is really great because you can give a reproducible example does not allow for much discussion. I have personally never posted on there. I'm too terrified, but you can search for the solutions. Um, Twitter is really, really good for discussion, but unless your code is very short, you can't really um, uh, supply a reprex there and you can't search for the solution. So all of the discussions there are very ephemeral. Our studio community, and I would say maybe something like GitHub as well, is kind of a winner where um, you have a reprex, you can have a discussion and the solutions are searchable. And then Slacks can be super, super friendly but of course are only open to people who are in them. So I'll just close off um, with some useful resources. Once I've given you a, a taste of reprexes, these actually have a lot more information about how to make them and, and make them well. And then uh, this illustration by Allison Horst, which a common thing if you search for reprex talks is help me help you. And that's really the goal here is to, to help people help you out so that they're less frustrated and actually want to help you. Thanks so much, Charlotte. That was amazing, as always. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Shilan asks, what's the best way or platform to reach out to the R Studio community? Yeah, so I'll drop a link here. The R Studio community is actually a forum um, that people go to for, uh, for uh, sorry, I, I can't multitask and, and drop the link while I talk. It's a forum where you can uh, post your code and people will help you with it. Chris Smith asking, does Reprex work with Microsoft Teams? I have never used Microsoft Teams, um, but I imagine if there's a way that you can uh, input a code chunk, then there is probably a way that you can um, take the output and, and put it in there. Any other questions for Charlotte? I see a question about trying to explain the, the piracy joke. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we, if need you to, rented we need a, to card Sheila and um, next time, yeah. not, not let first her in. <laughs> the first question is, do you know what a VHS is? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that influences whether or not I can answer. <laughs> that I know, that I know. <laughs> OK, yeah, so it, in the early 2000s, if you would like rent a VHS from Blockbuster, like with the with the trailers, they would also include anti privacy ads, where they would try to get you to not. Maybe it was DVDs. Try to get you to not uh, download a, a car. So, or to try. You wouldn't download a car, so why would you download a movie? I guess is the point. And there's anything else. Yeah, Faria, I would download a car if I could too. Yeah, Jake says, I feel like there's an art to generating the 
simulated data that shows the problem. We can see a benefit of reprex in regards to helping people practice doing that. Yeah, um, I think that that is that's half the battle. Like our, I mean, I think Jenny Bryan said recently, like that is eighty percent of the battle is is figuring out that data and, and getting people to include uh, a small amount of inline data in it and creating fake data that reproduces your problem is, I would say like the majority of it rather than, than focusing on the code. Cause a lot of the times you know about, um, about the, the code that's causing the problem. Yeah. Uh, John follows up. Um, do we have anything equivalent for shiny? That is a great question. I don't know. <laughs> I could look into it, John. It'd be a lot of moving pieces. Yeah, um, there is something new in Shiny, one of the newer versions where you can actually, um, so an issue with Shiny a lot of the time is that reactive objects, you can only uh, evaluate in a reactive context. So like while the Shiny app is running, which makes it really, really hard to debug, but there's a new setting where you can make your console reactive. So actually being able to mess around with the inputs and some of your functions um, without being in the Shiny app. And I imagine that maybe some of that would actually end up helping with it if you can distill the problem down small enough. I need debugging. I still find this the, the hardest problem. I just stick browsers in and and hope for the best. Any other questions? No more questions. We can just hang out. Yeah, we had three minutes just to yeah. hang out. Rohan, Thanks, you can Charlotte. turn your camera off for three minutes and take a break. <laughs> Thank you.